So I've had the uh, privilege of uh, going to Medjugorje on quite a few occasions since I first went in, I believe it was 96. And uh, ever since I've become a priest, whenever I go there with groups, I used to go with groups from Italy and then groups from here in, from Ireland as well. Um, if you've ever been to Medjugorje, there's a, a way of the cross up a fairly rough looking mountain. It's, um, there's no path, there is no path. There is, there are thorns, lots of thorns. There are rocks, boulders. Uh, it's even though like, I suppose at this stage, millions of pilgrims uh, have gone up, it's rough out. It's uh, uh, fairly unforgiving if you stub a toe. So um, uh, I say that because uh, I guess we started years ago doing this in our youth group that when we would do the, the Stations of the Cross, we'd actually do them barefoot. So it just kind of became a habit, not so much to kind of, you know, I don't want to be weaker this year than I was last year, but I think it's, it's, it's a good little practice of mortification. Anyway, long story short, um, when our group would arrive there at the, the, the foot of the hill, not really a mountain, um, I, just, I don't like tell anyone at all, I don't like make a big deal of it at all, but just as we're standing there, I'll just take off my, my sandals, usually sandals at that point, uh, I'll take off my sandals, and uh, then you see all the lads looking, going, uh, Father, uh, what you doing? <laughs> and, and then just quiet. I said, well, normally, you know, you can, you don't have to. There's no sign saying thou must ascend this mountain barefoot. Uh, but I said, well, yeah, normally I do it barefoot. And no, no sooner it has the kind of suggestion hit, especially the lad's ears, than there's shoes and socks flying everywhere in, in, into bags, you know what I mean? And away they go. Lads who've never seen the inside of church or chapel would be going up, Krijevats it's called, Cross Mountain, uh, barefoot, right? And there's something, I don't know, I always find, I always find it interesting. I've, I've, I've had the same experience over and over again. And I always find it interesting that, that, that something that is going to be uncomfortable is somehow attractive, especially to lads, which means guys for those who aren't Irish. Um, so, like, somehow we men are attracted to something that's going to be actually a little more difficult, Okay? Rather than, you know, lads, you know, we're going up a mountain now, it's going to be sweaty, dusty, thorny, and there's not, actually nothing up there when you get there. We just, we come back down again, you know? So there's nothing really to be achieved. You can pray the Stations of the Cross just as well down here if you wish. And all the lads go, oh yeah, grand, I think we'll play the Stations down here. No, no, one, no one says that. The fact that it's difficult is actually what makes it somehow Dare I say attractive? Why is that? I'm going to leave that hang for a sec. If you look at our reading here, uh, so the Syrian Naaman. Naaman, for all intents and purposes, might not be the nicest guy in the world. Okay? He was an army commander for the Syrians. And not only that, but they had invaded where our dear Jewish uh, brothers lived. right? And he took, it, it, it says quite clearly, uh, he took, during one of their raids, the Arameans, the Syrians, carried off from the land of Israel a little girl who had become a servant of Naaman's wife. Now, keep in mind, when we're talking about a raid here, we're talking about a raid. Okay, so the Syrians don't come down and say, hey, can we have any volunteers that come live with us in Syria? Anybody? No? No, how about you? No, no. Like they, like they broke into houses and took people and killed those who resisted. Like this, this isn't pleasant stuff. Okay, so this girl, I don't even know her, her name. She's a Jew. She's found herself now in a foreign country. She may have lost family members. It's quite likely if anyone resisted, if her, if her dad were trying, you know, save her, he would have been cut down in the story. So here she is in a foreign land, and her owner, some, it's really politically incorrect, but there you go, what, what am I supposed to call him? Uh, boss? You get my point. Um, yeah. Owner, it's not the right word, but there you go. It's, it's not nice, but that's the way it was seen back then, okay? In their, in their terms, her owner. Uh, nah, man. Probably the, the second most powerful man in the country, the commander of the army, king him, right? He commands the army, like in theory, he could, he could even revolt against the king, you know? So very, very powerful. So powerful and all as he is, he's got leprosy. Incurable, contagious, slow, 
wasting disease. All right, and no matter how many armies you have, no matter how many chariots, no matter how many soldiers, archers, whatever, you can't do anything when you've got leprosy. So he goes to the king and says, I've got leprosy. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Like, they probably had, you know, running water and beautiful, comfortable home and all the rest. And uh, can't do anything. Okay. Then the slave girl, right, who should have been, well, in, in human justice, in the, in the eyes of human justice, we'd say she should have been saying, ha, look at you now, you little, you little soldier, yeah. You know, uh, that's what she should have been saying. But she was saying, no, actually, if you'd like some help, um, we have some fairly good prophets down in Israel. I think they'll be able to help you. All right? Again, she, why, why, is she, why is she helping him? All right? This girl is obviously particularly good-hearted, that she would say to her, the guy who invaded her country, did a lot of damage, and took her away from her family, this will help you, or these people can help you. The prophets down in Israel, go. They'll help you. So Naaman asked the king. The king says, by all means, go. Obviously, the king, the king prized him as a commander, probably even as a friend as well. And they bring down an absolute wagon load of, of wealth and silver and gold and so on and so forth, all for Naaman's healing. So they get down. Where does Naaman go? Well, no, Naaman goes to the king. Who else is powerful down in Israel? So he goes to the king. He says, what am I supposed to do? You're a leper. I can't fix leprosy. And tears his clothes. And then the prophet Elisha hears that uh, the king has torn his clothes and says, look, let them come to me and I'll show them that there is still a God in Israel. Okay, so Naaman comes to, to Elisha. Now, this is where I, I, I love this bit. This bit of the story is just fantastic for us, for us today, or so many centuries later. Go and bathe seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will become clean once more. All right, so the Jordan, if you've ever been to the Holy Land, the Jordan is exceptionally unimpressive, right? It's, you kind of get there and you go, is that, is that, is that it? There's really nothing to it. It's about as wide as the chapel here and somewhat green. It's, you know, it's not, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing pretty about it at all. Uh, it's really, really unimpressive. You know, we hear about the Jordan, the Jordan River. It's, it's very significant, obviously, for the Jews, yes, but like, it's not like a major, you know, it's not the Danube. It's, it's, it's really, no, it's, it's not even half the size of the Shannon at any point. <laughs> you know, it's really, really unimpressive. So Naaman then says, hang on, you want me to go bathe seven times in the Jordan? He says, we have some fairly impressive rivers back where I'm from. Not sure if you knew, but uh, we've got even names them, you know what I mean? Surely the Abana and the Far, the far Par, and the rivers of Damascus are way better than any water in Israel. Why can't I just go bathe in one of them? They're impressive rivers. And Elisha, Elisha actually doesn't, he, Elisha doesn't, fight his case as such. He leaves it there. These are your instructions. Take it or leave it. And he kind of, and Naaman goes off indignant. Stupid river. <laughs> right? And, and then the, his servants say to him, Naaman, what do you have to lose? You're a leper. <laughs> like, no, no offense to you, king commander type person, but you, are, you have leprosy. He asked you to do something easy. And actually for Naaman, it was actually too easy. You know, going back to like thinking of Cross Mountain. If our faith is presented in terms that are too easy, it actually becomes less attractive for us. You know, so I think we've kind of gotten the, the, the technique or the, the approach wrong for as long as I can remember. So I can remember about 30 years, so maybe for 40 years. The approach has been make, make our faith as easy as possible, and that would make it more attractive. The fruit of this approach for the last 40 years has proven that making our faith easy empties your churches. Look around, especially today, but okay, from a year ago back. Uh, the churches are empty, especially of men, especially of young men. Where, where are all the 25-year-old men, students, you know, college students, in the prime of their lives? Where are they? If we keep saying that our faith is all about feelings and being nice and recycling and taking care of your neighbor, whatever that's supposed to mean. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's so vague and broad and kind of just, eh, just kind of have a spirituality. Oh, yeah, I think I have one of those, yeah. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's really easy, then what we have here is entirely irrelevant. 
It's irrelevant. I just don't need it. Oh, I'm grand. If Granny wants to go to Mass, fine. But it's just got nothing to offer me. So we have this delicate balance that we have to maintain in our faith where the Lord isn't trying to make us jump through hoops. So on one hand, it actually, it actually is kind of easy in that you bring a, a wee baby to a baptismal font and you say to the parents what you want to call the child and they say, John Joe. And you say, John Joe, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And strictly speaking, that's it. John Joe is now baptized, washed clean of all sin of original sin and any personal sin, if he had, which he didn't because he's small. Uh, he's now made a child of God. He's, you know, incorporated into the, into the mystical body of Christ. By doing that. Three times. You, it should be harder. Like, I mean, and even if you, I, I, it's very, very rare in Ireland for adults to be baptized. But if you've gone through the whole RCI program, and all the study that goes with it. And then as an adult, you're, you're baptized, you know, and all there's this huge build up. And then the bishop or the priest, whoever it is, will say to you, baptizing him, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. And that's it. That's it. So on one hand, it's actually, it's actually really easy. Uh, it's like the whole Naaman situation. If you think of so many of the prayers that we have, the Divine Mercy Chapel, it doesn't take seven, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Our rosary takes longer than most rosaries, unless you're from the north, and then it's going to take about half the length, but generally speaking, our rosary takes in or around 20-ish minutes, right? That's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy, but at times it's kind, of, it's kind of too easy. Maybe it should be worse. Maybe we should have to kind of um, pray the rosary barefoot, walking through a stubble field after the barley has been cut. Or you get a whole, <laughs> whole field full of men going, Arr, Hail Mary. <laughs> like, does it have to be miserable to actually attract us? I don't know. But on one hand, so many aspects of our faith are easy. They're actually really easy. Go to Mass on Sunday. Not hard. Really not hard. Pray every day. Again, in the grand scheme of things, really not hard. There are other things that are getting a little hard now. Like pray a rosary daily. We think it's hard because there's so much entertainment out there. But on the grand scheme of things, it's actually not. You know, we think it's because, oh, I've, I've so much Facebook to catch up on. And then there's this Netflix series of The Crown, which absolutely must be viewed at least four times. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm busy, <laughs> okay? So we think, we think we're busy. We think we've so much going on. But there really is time for the rosary, if you want. If you want to make time, there is. So on one hand, like, our, our faith is it's, it's quite simple. On the other hand, like, I think cons maybe it's the fact that consistency in our faith is what makes our faith hard. It's like you know, going to the gym once a month. You might be patting yourself on the back for being absolutely amazing. Going to the gym once a month is completely useless. <laughs> okay, so you can, but you can pat yourself on the back because I, I go to the gym, I've got a membership and all. Okay, how often do you go? Once a month. That's useless. You know, so maybe that's what makes the faith difficult. It's not that the elements are, are hard, but to be consistent in them. That requires, that requires discipline. That requires self-control. That requires me giving my time. So Naaman humbles himself, bathes in the river, does this simple act seven times, and is completely cured. Undeservedly, one might argue, but that's hence we see the mercy of God and this miracle has worked. So when we look at our faith, our faith has many simple things in it. Daily prayer, weekly mass at least, Eucharistic adoration couldn't be simpler. And the elements themselves are simple. Consistency in those elements is, is what's difficult. That's the challenge. And that's, that's what separates the men from the boys. That's what separates the goats from the sheep. Saints from sinners. I mean, are we going to try this? They're not difficult, but consistency is. Consistency is. As we've probably noticed so far in, in your Lenten observances as well. Maybe you made it two days, three days, four days before you fell. And then, you know, consistency is what's difficult. And so we ask the good Lord today. 
that we might join with our psalmist in this, this beautiful uh, chorus that we, we, we read five times today. My soul is thirsting for God, the God of my life. When can I enter and see the face of God? What does he want you to do to enter and see the face of God? Be faithful to him in the simple things, but be faithful daily. Be faithful daily. So we ask the good Lord to strengthen us in these efforts to become the saints that he's calling us to be.